I got a new house. Pretty cool, huh? New look. New style. Not really. I'm still wearing the same hat I did way back when in that piece of trash rental house I used to live in. New setup. The computer. The Magic 8 Ball. I think that was actually also in the old house. So, seems as though things have not changed all that much. But hey, regardless... What this all means is that a new setup means new games to play, yes sir. So without further ado, um, let's go find a game to play, hey, shall we? See you! Alright, let's see what is cooking today. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to my floor. It's pretty cool, huh? This is where the magic happens. So let's see what we got to review here. We got, um... Sonic Mega Collection, not bad, the classic Sonic games, although it doesn't have CD, uh, because it's a coward. Uh, no, I don't want to review that. How about, ooh, wipe out the game? Woo! <laughs> Why do they do that? Um, nah, I don't really want to review wipe out the game. It's okay, though. Not terrible. Let's see what else we got here. Let's get these straps out the way. Oh. Uh. Um. No, you know what? No, 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 not touching it. Don't, no, don't want to review it. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Nope, nope, you can't make, I'm not reviewing that game. No, not going to review it. Not, not reviewing that game. All right, I have my reasons. I would like for you to respect that. We're going to find someone else. It's going to be fun. What? Oh, no. No. Oh, yeah, it's there. Yeah, it's happening. Oh. All right. Fine, 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 fine. You win. I'll review Super Paper Mario. Look, th this game, where is it? This game is the bane of my existence. When I was a kid, I couldn't beat it. No matter how hard I tried, and every single level was just punishing. And then I quit uh, at the beginning of chapter four. So I was never able to beat Paper Mario, Super Paper Mario, excuse me. Oh, it's super, because it's on the Wii U, oh, cool. Fine, you want it this way? We'll do it this way. Today, we're reviewing and beating Super Paper Mario for the Wii. Drop it, how cool. Safety first, guys. Safety first. Our story begins with Peach being kidnapped, figures, but not by Bowser, by a new villain, Count Bleck, who uses his broken AF powers to take out Mario and then no-clip everyone else to a wedding ceremony. Wh what? Said ceremony being for Peach and Bowser, who are forcibly joined in holy matrimony, which results in a chaos heart being formed. Luigi does his best to stop Bleck, but it's no use, as Bleck commands the Chaos Heart to destroy the world, just as foretold in the Dark Prognosis, a book prophesizing the events of Super Paper Mario. So, bing bang boom, Bleck destroys the world, and everyone disintegrates into nothing. The end. Just kidding. Mario is awoken by Tippy, a pixel that informs Mario that Count Bleck has created a void of darkness that will destroy the world after a certain amount of time. Not wanting to waste any more of it, Tippy transports Mario to the town of Flipside where he meets Merlin, who informs Mario that he is the hero foretold of in the Light Prognosis and that it is his duty as hero to collect the eight pure hearts and use their power to destroy Count Bleck and prevent the end of the world. Along his journey, Mario comes across other Pixels, who we will talk more on later, as well as other characters such as Peach, Bowser, and finally, Luigi, who all join Mario on his quest to stop Count Bleck. Speaking of the Count, the game periodically cuts to him and his minions, Nastasia, I butcher that so hard, Mimi, O-Chunks, Dementio, and Mr. L, a mind-controlled Luigi, forced to do Bleck's bidding, all taking turns to try and stop Mario before he can become any stronger. It is during these scenes where the game also uncovers more and more of Count Bleck's backstory, and oh boy, 
There's a lot of it, and it is essential to understanding this game's story, so buckle up because we're gonna cover it. Originally going by the name Blumiere, he was a member of the Tribe of Darkness, a group that stole the Dark Prognosticus to prevent its power from being abused. One day, however, a human girl by the name of Timpani found an injured Blumiere and nursed him back to health, eventually leading to them falling in love. How cute. Blumier's father disapproves of their love, however, I've been there before, and decides to do the only logical thing one would do in this situation, which is abduct Impani, wipe her memory, and banish her from their dimension, forcing her to aimlessly wander world to world until the day she died. I mean, I don't see a problem with his logic if you don't. Luckily, Timpani is found by Merlin, who saves her life by turning her into the pixel Tippy. Blumiere, believing her to be dead, decides that life simply isn't worth living without her, and steals the Dark Prognosticus, setting off his plan to destroy every single world, kicking off the events of the game. You got all that? Good. After collecting the eight pure hearts, Mario and his friends travel to Castle Bleck to destroy Bleck once and for all. Tippy attempts to plead with Count Bleck, this is after Waffle stomping him into a shallow grave, might I add, but Bleck says it's too late and that he must be destroyed to prevent the end of the world. Before a choice could be made, however, Dementio attempts to kill Bleck, turns Luigi back into Mr. L, and forms himself and Luigi into a weird hodgepodge known as Super Dementio. Blah blah blah, Super Dementio is defeated through the power of love and friendship and eight more pure hearts. I'm not kidding. The void disappears from the sky, and all is well in the world of Paper Mario. Ha! <laughs> Just kidding! Defeating Super Dimensio actually wasn't enough to stop the Chaos Heart from destroying all worlds. With everything seemingly hopeless, Count Bleck realizes that by using the true love that he and Timpani share with one another to create another eight pure hearts, that's 24 we're at now, they can use them to destroy the Chaos Heart. However, this may mean that Blumiere and Timpani, Count Black and Tippy, keep up, may cease to exist. Having both made their choice, they ascend the stairs of the altar from the beginning of the game, announce their love for one another one last time, destroying the Chaos Heart once and for all, disappearing, never to be seen again. Like, ever. They, they never show up at any any Mario media. They're, they're, they're probably dead. They, they, they're, they probably just died. Eviscerated. Overall, the story itself is really good uh, honestly one of the best ever told in a mario game or any rpg RPG, for that matter uh however <laughs> y'all gonna hate me for this one there's one issue i did have with it which we'll get into later but other than that great easily though the aspect i just i love the most could not get enough of is just the sense of urgency that was given towards the overall goal of the game no matter how fast you move how many pure hearts you collect, that void in the sky is always growing, always one step ahead, and the only thing you can do as a player and as Mario is keep moving. This sense of urgency and importance to succeed gels with this game's story and Bleck's motivation as a villain so well in my opinion. A love-struck cult member who was driven to insanity after losing his other half? That's bad! That's really bad, especially with the kind of power Count Black holds. This man donated a thousand dollars to Pokimane, got ignored as she got up to get some food, and now he's tweeting at his friends not to come to school tomorrow. Guys, we gotta go! <laughs> the characters and dialogue are pretty enjoyable as well. Bowser is as sarcastic and witty as always. Peach is still the determined, no-nonsense princess, the norm of the Paper Mario franchise. She's a coward in the normal games, we all know that. And Luigi is probably one of my favorite characters this time around. He's never portrayed as some wussy pushover like he is in a lot of other games, and his own games for that matter, and consistently proves he's capable of handling himself. Considering the fact that he was just never allowed to do anything in the previous games, this is a welcome change in my opinion. You know, it honestly makes you wonder how easier the last Paper Mario games would have been if Mario just let him tag along. I don't know, hey, he's your brother! He isn't even fully playable until the very end of the game, by the way, which irks me a bit. Peach and Bowser become playable in chapters 2 and 3. Why does Luigi get shafted? Whatever. At least, it means more of Mr. L, which is very entertaining. One of the best characters in this game. Speaking of Mr. L, the rest of Count Black's minions are also worth mentioning. They're all diverse in design and personality, and there isn't a single one of them I'd call outright bad. Nastasia is my favorite, though. She is so passive-aggressive, and it just fits her so well. Definitely a highlight. But, like I said at the beginning, 
of my thoughts of the story, there are some issues. I put them down, put the pitchforks down, put the pitchforks, put the Molotov cocktails down, put the frags down. I just... I just want to talk. Let's all be cool, alright? Let's all be cool. One of the issues I found myself having was the crucial point that the Dark Prognosticus is prophetic, but the Light Prognosticus isn't. It's just a more optimistic way of foretelling the events that the Dark Prognosticus does. That's kind of confusing, but it loops around to being cool when you realize you're essentially on a quest to prove one prophecy right over the other, that one being the Light Prognosticus. So, alright, not too big of a deal, and it works itself out. However, there is also another tiny problem I have though, and again, be cool, be cool, it's the love story between Count Bleck and Tippy. Now, like I said before, hear me out, hear me out, it's a good love story. Emo dude from TikTok screaming in his car vibes aside, it's good, but the execution in my opinion is stilted and a bit underdeveloped. The entirety of Count Black and Tippy's backstory, how they fell in love, how Tippy was banished, how Count Black became Count Black, the main villain of the game, how this game's whole history and story was set in motion, you ready for this? Has three minutes worth of cutscenes in a game that has over five and a half hours of them, and it is all told through us through plain text on a black background. Look, I understand they're most likely doing this to add a level of mystique to it or something like that, but I feel that more visually driven cutscenes would have benefited here. Show me Bloomier and Timpani meeting near the cliff where Bloomier fell. Show me them watching the stars. Show me Timpani aimlessly wandering dimensions after being banished. Show me Bloomier looking for her. I want to see these things, not read them. Now, I will say it could also be argued that it's done the way that it is to keep the relationship between them more of an abstract concept of love. You know, the idea that two people simply can't live without one another, and providing more context through visual cutscenes might provide too much personification to that concept and tarnish it as it'd be harder to believe that one's love for another could be so strong, but I still would have preferred it over what we got. Show, don't tell, as they always say, and in my opinion, seeing these short blips of text played out through actual cutscenes would have been more impactful. Regardless, it's still a great story, easily a 9 out of 10 when looking at the narrative alone. But we're not just looking at a story, are we? No, 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 of course not. That would be only half the game. So what do you say we get into that gameplay? You know, I'm actually pretty proud of that transition, I'm not gonna lie, and, um, yeah. What about this transition? <sighs> yeah, I just transitioned back to myself. It's the kind of content you get on this channel. Deal with it. But, besides that, everyone knew Paper Mario 64 and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door were some of the best RPGs of all time. Like, like, of all, of all time. Like, so good, in fact, that they transcend being just the best RPGs of all time into being some of the best video games of all time, in my honest opinion. So, with that being said, everyone and their mother was curious as to how Super Paper Mario was going to follow in the previous game's footsteps. And... It didn't. Yes. It's well known nowadays, but instead of being another turn-based RPG like its older siblings, it was instead a 2D platformer with a twist. Upon pressing the A button, Mario will flip into a 3D perspective, and wow, they really thought this was an acceptable camera angle, causing certain objects to appear and move in the level. This overall change was because producer Kensuke Tanabe, probably mispronounced that, again, I do apologize, wanted each entry in the series to have a different genre and core gameplay elements. Thank you, Wikipedia. With that said, Super Paper Mario doesn't exactly play like a 2D platformer, even without taking the 3D gimmick into consideration. In the sense that levels aren't just beaten by moving left to right and stomping enemies along the way. Levels in this game require more thought than that, implementing puzzles in almost, if not every stage you traverse through. Some good, some bad. And I mean that. I mean, some of these puzzles follow the conventions of what it takes to be a good puzzle 
to a T, making them some really solid, rewarding puzzles to solve. Others, on the other hand, others don't. These bad puzzles can range from mindless repetition to backtracking to giving the player ridiculously long codes and sequences way too long to memorize, forcing them to pull out their phone or computer to type them down. Or, if you're like me and many other gamers who play this as kids, getting up and getting a pencil and paper and jotting it down. Now, Okay, it, it's not ruin the game type of bad, like Castlevania 2, which I can totally use as an example, given the fact that I was a kid born in 2003 and totally had an NES growing up, but it's just that the puzzles are stupid, <laughs> like, like really dumb. I mean, fellas, who could forget the dreaded, infamous chapter 2-3, which requires the player to hit a block 100 times, run on a hamster wheel for about 6 minutes, then talk to a dude who has a code to a safe, which is 8 digits long. And as I said, there's more instances of this. 1-3 has you backtracking to jump under a tree 10 times, 3-2 has you backtrack to ground pad and pegs in the right order, and 5-1 has you backtrack to get a block code from an NPC, then has you do it again, but then you have to type out the word Please to him six times like he just every time you do it he's like no 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 not enough say it again six times and the code they give you is Super Paper Mario oh oh my fault Super Paper Mario's big pimpin it's, it's got the hat it's got the suit, it's got the cane, it's got the strut, it's got the shoes, it's got the hose, it's got the 70s Cadillac convertible. My bad, fam! My, 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 get out of my face, why don't you? Little stupid man, piece of trap, man, I would have beat your- As I said previously, when the puzzles are good, they're good. They can tax a brain, have a great sense of reward when you find the solution, and the new ability to flip into 3D helps add variety along with just being cool to do. There's switch puzzles, there's pattern puzzles, there's basic logic puzzles, there's puzzles that involve Mario and co going into the background and platforming there. It's, it's good stuff, but when it's one of those examples I stated, be prepared to get heated because it is just not fun or well designed. While we're still on the topic of puzzled, let's talk about the things you'll be using the most to solve them. The pixels. Throughout your journey, you'll come across a wide variety of pixels. This game's version of partner characters from previous games. Pixel provides Mario and friends with a unique ability, some more niche than others. Tippy is the Navi of this game, essentially. She gives hints, provides insight on certain set pieces, and can find hidden objects needed to progress in a level like doors or switches. Throw picks up enemies, Boomer's your bomb, Slim makes you invisible, but only when you're stationary, Thudley's your ground pound, Carry is a hoverboard, Fleep sucks, Cud your hammer, and Dottie makes you small. There's also four optional pixels you can get. Barry makes a barrier around your character, Dashel increases your speed, Piccolo plays music, and Tiptron is just a robot version of Tippy you can get after the end of the game when Tippy and Count Black disappear. As I said, some are more niche than others, but all besides the optional ones do get used at some point. Most had some great puzzles tied to them, as well as just being fun to use against enemies and bosses. My personal favorites are Throw, Boomer, and Carry. Use Carry with Bowser against the final boss and congrats, you just turned it into a joke. While they're pretty well utilized in terms of gameplay, the- oh my- the same cannot be said for their characters, of which there is very little. Rarely are the pixels given things to say outside of their intro cutscenes. Aside from a few exceptions like Barry chilling in a bush and Fleep singing in a porter party while waiting for toilet paper, that chapter sucks by the way, but we'll get to that later. These guys just become quiet abstract shapes that just have no feelings on whatever situation you'll find yourself in throughout the game. Compare this to 64 and especially Thousand Year Door, this is just... No, this doesn't cut it. The partners in the previous games had so much more personality, and their added dialogue gave the cutscenes more depth and weight, and even without comparing the partners to the ones from the previous games, the pixels' lack of input on the ongoing plot completely clash with the simple fact that other characters have dialogue to convey how they're feeling in the current moment. 
Moving away from puzzles and pixels, let's talk about that level design, shall we? When not puzzle solving or traversing flip and eventually flop side, we'll get to that one later, Super Paper Mario has you adventure through about 32 unique levels, or chapters as they're called, and the overall quality is very so-so in my opinion. Some are legitimately fun to play through with enjoyable puzzles, interesting set pieces, and sweet and simple platforming. You just, you learn to appreciate it. Chapter 1 is a great first world, doing an excellent job of preparing you for the rest of the game. All of Chapter 2 is good, except that one level and chapter three is jam-packed with awesome levels it's all in this 8-bit style you storm a fortress fight a blooper climb a huge tree and break into a castle great stuff however the levels begin to dip in quality about halfway through chapter four has you wandering around aimlessly in space for two chapters and climbing a bunch of mountains it's tedious chapter five has you backtracking in a prehistoric desert Chapter 6 just makes you fight a single enemy one after another for two chapters, then walk through literal purgatory. Chapter 7 starts out interesting, having you explore a place known as the Underwear. Very clever, guys. And then following that up with a level consisting of a fun torch puzzle, satisfying platforming, rewarding puzzles, and a nod to Earthbound with its level boss. But then the second half of the chapter is just a bunch of clouds and, and it's boring and the levels are way too big and they look way too samey it it's a slog chapter four has that problem too because you're just looking at space the whole time and everything looks the same chapter eight definitely isn't as bad though every chapter in chapter eight still looks the same and the maze in eight four can blow me but it's overall a great payoff to the rest of the game everything in it presents a decent challenge from the puzzles to the platforming to the enemies the whole nine yards it really is a great final world to cap off this game a final boss is still ridiculously easy though like ooh, 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 I, I, I sneezed and he toppled over L sorry officer that's just what happened speaking of the bosses they're pretty good. There's plenty of diversity, from simple fights in an arena, to running along the back of Fractale the Dragon, to the aforementioned Earthbound reference with three multicolored chain chops. The first stage of Francis's fight, the nerdy iguana from Chapter 3, is just a dating sim. And, yeah, I mean, it, it hits a little close to home, but, you know, it, it's, it's fun. It's fine. A little lonely. But, uh... But, uh, but it, it, there really isn't a single boss I'd consider bad. Even the final boss, with, again, it being as easy as it is, is still fun to play and still maintains a climactic tone the entire time. My personal favorites would have to be Mr. L. He's a stellar character. One of his fights is a homage to side-scrolling space shooters like Gradius and Silver Surfer. I'd go so far to say that anyone who's into good boss fights should pick this game up based off the boss fights alone, I think you'll really enjoy it. Something you and the rest of the players most likely won't enjoy though is Flip and Flopside. Flip and Flopside are the game's hubs. You start in Flip and make your way into Flop as the story progresses. Now, excuse me. <laughs> They're fine worlds with great detail and plenty to do. My problem stems with how it's implemented. Instead of a more streamlined approach, like the Pure Hearts simply unlocking the next chapter, the Pure Hearts instead need to be placed in a Pure Heart pillar located within the outskirts of Flip and Flopside. This means that between every chapter, and like literally every chapter, you are venturing into the outskirts of town to find these pillars to unlock the next chapter. There's no real hint, it gets more and more tedious with every pillar because every pillar takes longer to find, it turns the game from an entertaining puzzle platformer to hide and seek, and it's not a fun game of it. The game is just simply better when going level to level, flipping in a 3D with Mario, gliding with Peach, breathing fire with Bowser, jumping high with Luigi. So when the game stops the player to tell him, hey buddy, you had enough fun for now, go stumble around outside until you find what you need to get back to the good stuff, it's lame. Looking for the heart pillars is kind of like playing hide and seek and you're the seeker and instead of actually hiding your friends just ditch you and go inside their houses to do whatever and then you're just wandering around aimlessly, wondering where they are, and then you happen to glance through their window and see them playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 without you on their Xbox. I don't really want to talk about this anymore, it sucks. 
Super Paper Mario is an interesting time. Story first, gameplay second. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a whole genre of gaming based entirely around telling a story with as little player input as possible. And hey, guess what? It works. And for a fair amount of Super Paper Mario, the same can be said. The story of Bleck vowing to destroy all worlds because he lost the one person he truly loves is a great narrative. It's interesting to see someone so heartbroken be in possession of that much power. To see Mario and Co. thrown into the middle of it all. To see these wonderfully stylized worlds get worse and worse with every step taken. At its worst, and I mean its worst, Super Paper Mario's narrative is decent. That's its worst. Speaking of style though, this game, whew, whew, yes please, there's not a dull set piece to be seen. Colors pop, chapters are plenty diverse, just an all around beautiful game even when you're doing the least fun things in it you're still having plenty of stuff to look at however that gameplay second mentality that was adopted for this game means some of the gameplay is gonna drag irritate you simply put there's gonna be parts of the game where the only thing keeping you going is that story with next to no fun to be had in the actual gameplay department itself. Take chapter 4 for example, I've alluded to it before but in my opinion it is the worst that this game has to offer in terms of level design and gameplay. Half of it you're wandering around empty space, which by the way there's a lot of wandering in this game, get used to that. One level has you backtracking over giant hills, there's a level like that in chapter 5, the same level where you have to input the code and say please six times. It, it, it's a mess and chapter four, just jumping 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 and the last level of the chapter while fun it's the best one of chapter four by far still has parts where you'll just be wandering around looking for the next way to progress it gets really tedious at times let me tell you and this kind of level design turns the enemies for the worst from being you know satisfying things to jump on as they should be in platformers they become obstacles that just get in the way as you run back and forth trying to look for the next door to go through or the or the next switch to hit. It, 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 it shouldn't be this way. Enemies should be fun to step on, but the level design turns that fun gameplay mechanic against them. And the 3D gimmick. Up until now, I've spoken about it very sparingly, and there's a reason for that. It, because it's 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 just kind of there it's usually used for the same purpose find something you couldn't see before you can also only be in 3d for a limited time and again the camera angle sucks like it's the one thing in this game i just say is outright terrible some stuff's bad this is terrible but if you stick through that all of that all of these things in super paper mario you will have experienced a game with an excellent story, with some fun puzzles to solve, a visually interesting and charming hub despite what they have you do in it, and solid platforming. There was not a single point in my entire playthrough, or when writing this entire script, which I am reading off of right now, which on and off have by the way taken me at least four months, look I'm slow, I'm slow, I do apologize, I'm slow. But not, not once in me playing the game, writing the script, did I think to myself, this game is not worth my time, I am wasting my time, this is bad. Because this simply isn't that kind of game. And compared to later entries in the series, hey man, that's pretty darn good. In many ways, despite the gameplay change, this was the Paper Mario series end of an era. Think of the diverse characters, the the interesting villain, the uh, unique visuals, and an in-depth story. Th this was it, man. The next game, it, it was Sticker Star, man. We all know what how bad that game is. I've never played it, but like, if everyone says it's bad, and then like, the one person in the back room says it's good, who are you gonna listen to, man? And then Color Splash, and then Origami King. It's just, this really is the end of the era for Paper Mario, and Honestly, hey man, it could have gone out way worse. So if you're out and about in a game store and you see it, dude, pick it up. 
I got my copy for 25 bucks at a GameStop in an outdoor mall. Buy it online. Regardless of how you obtain it, you really do owe it to yourself as a fan of Mario, as a fan of Paper Mario, as a fan of story-driven games. You gotta have it in your collection, man. It's it's a cult classic. Wow. What a game, man. And what a time to be had talking about it. Man. Like I said in the beginning of the video, this game used to be the bane of my existence as a kid. I just couldn't beat it. I spent days in that mansion. I endlessly hunted those heart pillars to no avail, and after all of it, I didn't even get halfway through. So, after all these years later, like a literal decade later, finally being able to sit down beat that boss in a submission, and finally be able to say I've beaten this game, once again a game I do recommend as it is a decent time overall, I did enjoy my time with it, but still being able to say I've beaten this game, that's progress, that's dedication, that's easily easy, and ladies and gentlemen, that is my review of Super Paper Mario! Y'all thought I was gonna do it, but I did! Woo! It took me like a year, bro! It's been like a year since I started to do this, and I finally did it, and everybody thought I couldn't do it, and I bet all y'all doubted me, all y'all doubted me, but nah, nah, I said I was gonna do it, and I did it, it's here, it's here, it's somewhere, I threw it, I don't know where it is, but this is the review, this is easily easy, this is the face that's just gonna upload whenever he wants, it's gonna be a banger, it's gonna be excellent, it's gonna be easily easy. And with that all said, I'll see y'all next time. Woo! Who wants clam chowder? I don't know. I'm out.